Iluvatar showed forth his power, and he changed the fashion of the world, and a great chasm opened in the sea between Numenor and the Deathless Lands, and the waters flowed down into it, and the noise and smoke of the cataracts went up to heaven, and the world was shaken. Hey everyone, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Here is a video suggested to me on a post a few weeks ago from Dragoroth. Thank you very much. Today we are discussing why Iru Aluvatar intervened against men on behalf of the Valar, causing the downfall of Numenor, but he seemingly did nothing to help men, elves, and dwarves against Melkor during the War of the First Age. Related articles and videos that helped with the creation of today's video are in the description and cards. My friends, thank you all so much for being here and for joining me. Let's begin our tale. First, let's dive into the premise of this video itself. We cannot be entirely sure that Eru did nothing against Morgoth in the War of the Jewels, what the conflict was called in the First Age. But I do know what you mean. We know that Eru explicitly causes the downfall of Numenor and the reshaping of Arda in such a methodical way, but does not so directly intervene in such a large way anywhere else in the canon after the creation of the world. But it is worth mentioning that we do not know for sure that he did not do any work in many subtle ways against the Dark Lord, his own creation during Morgoth's reign. I have a video discussing Eru's character history and the instances of his direct and potential interventions for more details on that. So as for the question at hand, there are a few elements at play. Starting at the beginning with the music of the Ainur, Eru says to Melkor, And thou, Melkor, shalt see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. In my mind, this is one of the most important lines in the entire Silmarillion, for if we philosophically extend it out past just the music, and see that line referring to any plans or actions that Melkor might take, not just the music, but things that he does during his time in Middle-earth, we can see something different. Again, this might just be how I'm reading the line, but in a way this actually solves the problem of evil in Tolkien's works, as there was nothing that Melkor could devise that did not have its source within Eru, father and creator of all things. Nor could Melkor's devices change the music against Eru's will, for any that would try would only serve to make the vision of Eru's plans for the world of Arda more like his intent. The more that one acted against Iluvatar, the more one was actually being an instrument of Eru's devising to create something more wonderful than the original actor could have possibly imagined. Again, that's with a particular reading of this line, and I tend to actually read it this way, because again, it so aptly solves the problem of evil from a philosophical point of view within Tolkien's works. And thus we see that all things acted in accordance with the will of Iluvatar, even Melkor, even the Numenorians. Free will, which came from the flame imperishable at the heart of the world, and that which was with Eru himself, was given to the children of Eru, men, to do as they would, yet still in accordance with some level of determinism set out by Iluvatar. Now, one may argue that since they were not the children of Eru in the same way as elves, men or even the adopted dwarves, the Ainur, Valar, and Maiar did not have the same amount of free will in the same way, but I reject this, and I do believe that they did have a similar sort of free will to people, but had more rules in place that they had to abide. Rules on their free will, concerning things such as interfering with the children of Iluvatar in Middle-earth and so forth. And all except Melkor generally attended to these rules. One such rule would be that the Valar could not take up arms directly against the children of Eru, which we will return to in a bit. To make my point here, I think that despite the evils of Melkor, his attempts at dominating Arda and so forth, he was destined to lose, as the Valar were allowed to fight him. And he had already lost to them once in the ancient Elder Days, and he would be defeated by their designs again at the end of the First Age. So Eru already knew that the Valar were a force great enough to stop Melkor or Morgoth should they want to. He did not need to intervene on their behalf. Besides this, the evils of Melkor served the greater plans of Eru, getting back to our quote from the music of the Ainur. As again, if we extend the meaning of that quote to plans and actions rather than just the music, everything Melkor did, Eru knew he would do, and to some degree, needed him to do. To shape the world of Arda, to mar it, to make the children of Eru become who they were meant to be. 
just as fire and ice create balance, and light and dark do so as well. The children of Eru needed Melkor and later Sauron to create balance for themselves and the world overall, at least in the visions of Eru. Iluvatar knew that, despite all of the horrors and atrocities that Morgoth committed against the Free Peoples, he was a necessary part of the plan for Arda, and eventually the combined forces of the children and people of the Valar, if not the Valar themselves, would inevitably defeat Morgoth. It was certainly messy, and victory did not always seem certain, but I imagine that it must have been. For why would Eru create a world and his children just to see them all slain and enslaved by Morgoth very early on, with no chance of hope or victory, just more of the same torment forever. Morgoth, or Melkor, was a great challenge for the Free Peoples, one that they were meant to overcome alongside the Valar and Maiar. Now, the fall of Numenor is a lot more tricky and messy. Going back to what I said earlier, the Valar were not allowed to coerce, dominate, or take up arms against the children of Iluvatar, elves, men, and dwarves. And the children of Iluvatar had free will. This is all hinted at and explicitly stated at different points in Tolkien's Legendarium, including the peoples of Middle-earth and Morgoth's Ring, where the Valar weren't allowed to do such direct action against the children. So since the free will of men drove them towards evil and rebellion against the Valar during their time in Numenor, even to a point to where they would assail the Valar, the Valar could not lawfully destroy them and remain loyal to Eru. They could not even defend themselves. Now, this begs the question of what happened to one such as Amandil, who went west and never returned, but that's a tangent. The Valar could not fight against men of Arpharazon who wished to slay them, and only Eru himself could intervene in this instance, and so they prayed to him and gave up their own mastery of Arda for nothing else could be done lawfully, so he intervened. Again, with Melkor, there were opportunities and avenues the people of Arda, including the Valar, could take to defeat him. But concerning the downfall of Numenor, there was nothing the Valar could do to lawfully stop the Numenorians at that point, so Eru had to, because they chose to assail them of their own free will, and the Valar could not directly attack any of the children of Eru. The Numenorians were his children, evil though they became, and it was not the evils of Melkor that they needed to face to be taught a lesson, but the creator himself, and they would of course lose that battle. Surely, there may be other arguments to be made concerning why Eru intervened with Numenor, but not with Melkor, but this is where I'll leave it as to not overcomplicate this video or subject. From this inquiry into why Eru intervened with Numenor but not with Melkor, we see that the experiences and conflicts we face shape us into the people we are meant to be. We must remember that when we are in our greatest struggles. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this Middle Earth Explained video. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on all of this? Is there anything you would add to this explanation? Let me know in the comments below. I think it is a very interesting religious and philosophical conundrum within Tolkien's world. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider getting some candles from our friends Mythology Candles, or some Weta or United Cutlery Lord of the Rings sword statues and other replicas from Castle Khan. Use the code WEST at checkout. Please check out our merch and Patreon. Thanks to our Valor tier patrons and YouTube members, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putnam, Blair Scouten, Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Reese Jenkins, Adam Petrolick, Anthony Harmon, Arthur, Merlin, Dale Davis, Kingswell Project, and King of Games 2500. Thank you so much to all of our patrons and YouTube members. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today. And I'll see you all again on Sunday with an epic character history on Hurin Thalion, he who is cursed by Morgoth. My friends, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.